It's been a great pleasure to be able to host, chair this important event where Patrick Jones um, is here to celebrate the fact that um, he is a professor. Um, he was actually made a professor a couple of years ago, right? So I think it was about in 21, so we've had a bit of a delay on that. Uh, so we're gonna, this is one of the catch-up ones. Um, so he's really quite established in his role as a professor, having had two years to fit into it, or two or more years to fit into it. He is a professor of metabolic engineering. Engineering in, a, in, a, in, the, in our department is a good thing. He's bringing these special skills associated with entrepreneurship as well as engineering. And when he arrived in the department, which was 2013, towards the end of 2013, then Murray Selkirk, in his wisdom, decided that he would be um, associated with me as his line manager. And I had not been a line manager of anybody then, not that I could remember anyway. In fact, I think I've, I've, still got a, I've still got a piece of paper where Murray officially says, you're gonna be line manager from now on on these things, and you have to sign to agree, and I've still got it and I haven't signed yet. <laughs> uh, um, but anyway, so I played the role as your line manager, um, and what that meant was that we met up every now and again and talked about stuff, and I gave him the great um, benefits of my experience as a line manager, since I'd had none, and then we winged it together. Uh, but I'd figured that the, the best thing to do was just to give you my confidence and interest, and we hit the various targets that were required in a career in this place. And so the big target was that last one in uh, 2021. And congratulations. And, and I think it wasn't too difficult. You think we had a good time. And I think that was the, that's the important thing about this, that in a place like this, then you think it's gonna be tough. But in fact, we hit the targets. And that was because of all of your efforts and only a small amount of encouragement from me. And so what we're going to hear about now is the background to all of that, I guess, the, the previous career, and it's an interesting one, uh, and what's been done since Patrick arrived here. And so now I'm going to hand over to him to give us those details. So thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Bill, for that entertaining introduction. And I remember, too, that you said that uh, one of the lessons that I remember strongly is that you said that I should find my, my herd or my, my kind of people. Tribe. My tribe, that's right, not the herd. <laughs> and, and then follow them and persist and be there, etc. And I remember that quite strongly. And it's interesting because I feel like, uh, especially with uh, Olaf, who's going to do the word of thanks later on, he, he was part of that tribe. And so that's, that's still with me. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, also Meg Carter. Um, I can't see Meg anymore, but she's the one and her team that has uh, organized all of this. And, and you can see all the the people behind all the equipment as well. So thank you very much for that. And yeah, Bill is gone, and now it's the beginning. So sunlight-dependent uh, biochemistry, the commercialization of that, that's what I'm going to be talking to you today. And it's a public lecture, so I'm trying my best to make it understandable in the broader sense, and, and it's great to see even young people here as well um, joining this lecture. So, first question is, what do I actually mean by this slightly complicated title? Well, with respect to sunlight-dependent biochemistry, I refer to photosynthesis and what we normally associate with plants. Plants are really good at using sunlight, and water, 
and then carbon dioxide from, from air. And fixing that carbon dioxide and incorporating it into a product. Now, in the case of plants, most of that product is just more plants. And when it comes to commercialization, that's pretty much about making a business with that sunlight-dependent biochemistry. And that's what I'm referring to here. Here's an example of sunlight-dependent biochemistry that's connected to my past as well. Uh, we started a winery in 1999 in McLaren in Adelaide, and these are just some Shiraz growing uh, south of Adelaide. Now, you could sell those grapes as they are for a reasonably low sum of money and eat them. But instead, you could crush them, add some yeast, or perhaps be lucky with the native ones that are there, and ferment that into wine which is usually, in most cases, much higher valued and uh, more interesting as well. Now, that's a two-stage process where, in the first case, you have the plants taking all those ingredients and making uh, grapes, and then the sugar that's in those grapes is converted by the yeast into ethanol. And then all the other molecules that also exist in the grapes and are generated by yeast as a, as a byproduct end up and become what is known as wine. Now, what if you could transfer that into a different system? In this case, using microbes that we call cyanobacteria. Now, I'm not suggesting that we would use cyanobacteria to make wine, because it probably would taste awful. But that's essentially the kind of process that we're talking about here. So what are cyanobacteria? Cyanobacteria are microorganisms, they're bacteria, and they exist everywhere, in the soil, in water, in the Arctic, and in the warm places as well. And in the lab, we can culture them, grow them on plates, we can grow them in liquid, And if we ask a microscopy expert to look a bit more closer, you can see more detail. So we zoom in, we can see individual cells. In this case, this particular cyanobacteria forms a filament. Zooming closer at the cellular level, this is what they look like as a cell. And inside that cell, is a cartoon of the metabolism. I'm going to explain a bit further what I mean by metabolism. But first, let's talk about the history. Several billion years ago, cyanobacteria were very important for us. They were responsible for the accumulation of oxygen in the very beginning. And that was essential for us more complex species like humans and probably simpler ones before that to actually evolve in the first place. So we have very much cyanobacteria to thank for, for our existence. But nowadays, most of us know cyanobacteria, or algae as they're also called, as a problem. You may have gone to your holiday and you look into the lake that you're hoping to swim in and you can see this slimy looking feature. And in fact, is some of them actually excrete uh, toxic compounds as well, so you do need to be a bit careful. But what I like to argue is that there's, there's also something really good that you can use cyanobacteria for. They fix carbon dioxide, just like the plants, and also some of them, only some of them, are able to fix nitrogen as well. This is a very unique feature that only certain bacteria have. And it so happens to some of them can fix both carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Furthermore, they're microbes. So we can grow them under industrialized conditions. So we can use them for industrial biotechnology. So lots of great features with this class of organisms. 
Now I'd like to take a step back and explain some of the things which all you probably know about, just to remind you about the reasons why, about some of the bigger issues that we could try to address with renewable biotechnology. One is the biodiversity crisis, and in this case, associating it with uh, palm oil industry, for example. Now, it isn't necessarily the palm oil industry that is the problem. It's rather that it's, it's too good and too popular. The expansion of land is uh, resulting in a biodiversity crisis and also releasing huge amounts of greenhouse gases as well. In this experiment that I found on Wikimedia, uh, there's, there's a control on the left that has no nitrogen added. And on the right, there is nitrogen added. And you can probably see which one the farmer would prefer. This would be much more uh, profitable for them to pursue, right? So adding nitrogen to agriculture is very, very important. But unfortunately, a lot of the nitrogen that's added on agriculture ends up in the environment. And only in Europe, it's costing up to 300 billion euros a year, mainly in health-related costs, but also in ecosystem-related costs. Another big challenge, of course, is climate change. As you know, the carbon dioxide and many other greenhouse gases have accumulated quite substantially in just recent times. This is something that we desperately all need to contribute towards. Now, if I focus down on the chemicals industry, uh, the chemi chemicals industry alone is responsible for approximately 7% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And typical examples include plastics, but also the nitrogen fertilizer, alone responsible for 2% of greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> now, one of the things that I, I have thought about lately is that in my cozy home in, in London, I look out the window and I can't see any effect of climate change. And is that what, it's, what is making me not do enough to contribute towards solving this problem? Because I can't see it. So I looked for some evidence, and this is from Pakistan in 2010 when there was flooding uh, taking place. Um, and as you know, there's been recent flooding as well. And the story goes that spiders fled when the flood came and fled up into the trees and made it their new home. And, so there's, and then on top of that, in the background, you can see the remains of the flooding. So you can see con concrete evidence of the impact of that flooding. If we saw that in London, and we could really attribute it to climate change, maybe we would do more. And here's an example of why that could work. David Attenborough, as we all know, when he raised awareness about plastics, people sprung into action. And also with the COVID test, we knew that we needed a solution to solve the COVID crisis, the pandemic. And there was really an amazing transformation and action taking place to solve these problems. But we don't see quite as much action when it comes to climate change or the nitrogen crisis, for that matter, where it's not much happening at all. Anyway, so how could we use these organisms to try to contribute towards solving some of these problems? I, I, I would be a fool to say it's going to solve the problems, but at least we could contribute towards them. This is a, an image of cyanobacteria. And there, it's a cartoon. They're really good at making more cyanobacteria. That's their job, just to grow, essentially. If we zoom in to this hand-drawn cartoon, supposed to look a bit like the original, um, we can once again see that metabolic network that I showed you earlier on. If we focus a little bit more closely, you start to see individual nodes and edges between those nodes. Well, those nodes, each one of them represents a chemical. The different chemicals, those that are close to each other are very, very similar because 
with metabolism, we're referring to the change between one chemical and the next. For example, between M1 and M2. This would be catalyzed. It's a chemical reaction catalyzed by an enzyme. And typically, what we see that for each of these transformations, you have a different enzyme. Sometimes, one enzyme can do many jobs, but it's usually one enzyme per, per reaction. And there's approximately 1,000 or so of these reactions inside every cell, if not more. Now, the exciting bit is if we can introduce some new elements to this. If I add a new enzyme that comes from somewhere else, or I've engineered this enzyme to improve it, I can get a new metabolite, in this case, M8. I add a few more, and now we have M11. Imagine if M11 is a very valuable compound. This is metabolic engineering, doing small changes. Here we have four changes, four introductions of new enzymes out of a 1,000. So we're really just scraping the surface of it all. We could also modify the native metabolism to undo the competition as well. Now, where do we get these genes from? Well, you could get them from dogs, lizards, birds, or spiders. Technically, you could. It's not like we're going into the dog and taking the the piece of DNA out of them, we have their sequence, so we can synthesize the DNA in the first place. Now, these are extreme examples, and it probably would instill some element of fear of Frankensteinianism, or whatever it might be called. Uh, but don't fear. It, it simply illustrates the potential, the opportunity of this incredible diversity of DNA that we have available. In fact, it's in most cases, we use bacterial DNA inside our bacteria. Here's an example of a chemical pathway that we constructed from new. It doesn't exist in any organism as far as we are aware, so we made it by combining different enzymes. In this case, beginning with octanoyl ACP, it's a chemical that exists in probably most species, in fact adding two enzymes, a third one, AHR, actually already exists inside the species, and a helper enzyme, you can make one octanol. That's an alcohol. It's a bit like ethanol. It's just bigger, and it's very useful, potentially. Using essentially the same approach, we constructed a range of different systems to produce fuels including propane, which you can use instead of LPG gas. We have petrol components and also diesel replacements. One octanol was tested by Volkswagen and found to be a really useful uh, replacement molecule, essentially, for diesel, whereas methyl dodecanoate is essentially biodiesel. The difference is, instead of using palm oil and lots of processing, we directly converted from CO2 into the ready product in one step. I'm going to take a bit of a side story here, because there's two kind of parallel lines going on in our group. Going back to the nitrogen story, I said the farmers need nitrogen fertilizer. The problem is that almost half of the nitrogen fertilizer ends up in the environment, creating pollutants uh, that themselves are greenhouse gases, as well as health pollutants. And then on top of that, just to make that chemical fertilizer in the first place, you produce even more greenhouse gases. Now, what if we could use this CO2 and nitrogen from air with our nitrogen and carbon-fixing cyanobacteria <coughs> and produce something that we give back to the soil? as a fertilizer? Well, it's not entirely new. We're not the first people to do it. There have been publications before, 
but we also repeated these kinds of experiments in our lab. So here's just an example of the control versus the additional algae. You can see that you're growing more plants when you add these nitrogen-fixing algae. Similarly, when we have uh, arugula, rucula, uh, we can see a boost of growth as well. And further graphs, which probably are slightly complicated, but you can still see what they look like. Essentially, sometimes even improving upon the existing uh, fertilizer options that are out there. So together with the fuel molecules, and here, these fertilizing agents, you would really have to say that we have the technology already. Job done. Boxes ticked. So why aren't we rich already? Yeah. <laughs> very good question. These are big, very, very big markets. Well, I'd like to illustrate this with this image I also found from Wikimedia. It's a famous guy called Usain Bolt, and it's a bit unfair that I use Usain to illustrate something that's unfair, because he's probably just pure, raw talent. Um, but I, I like to say that he is the fossil fuel. And back here are all the other alternatives that are just struggling to keep up and not quite getting there, unfortunately. And the reason, there are many reasons why, but one big reason is money. It's simply very difficult to compete on price with fossil fuel. And that's why we still haven't taken over the world with our technologies. Now, one of the issues, particularly with algal biotechnology, and I apologize for the complexity here. This is a, the outcome of a meta-analysis done by uh, someone in the literature. But they looked at the cost to make a biofuel using algae. The only thing I want to highlight here is that there's a huge range. And these are all predictions. They're predictions. Now, people have grown algae industrially, but they certainly are not doing it to generate revenue with engineered algae as yet, as far as I'm aware. So we're having to predict what the outcome will be. It's a really nice study done by Mario Tradici in Italy, who's, who's one of our colleagues in, in, a, in an EU project. <clears throat> I like this study because instead of just predicting it, they went out and built it themselves. A one hectare system uh, in Italy, and then they published all the information. So you can see all the small little details. And they reached the conclusion that it's going to cost 12 euros per kilogram of biomass to produce algal biomass. And that's even before you make the chemical. If we assume that 50% of that goes into the chemical, we're looking at 25 euros per kilo per biomass. And that's not how much petrol costs when you go to fill it up. It's a lot cheaper. So it's going to be challenging to match that. So what I like to argue, and many others, I'm not the only one, is that we've seen this shift towards higher value products instead. So we look on, at product value on the y-axis, and you have scale, maturity, experience on the right, which we still haven't got with engineered algal biotechnology, is that we need to aim high. Sorry, start high and aim low. And the reason why we need to aim low is because it's not until we reach these kind of fuel replacement scenarios or petrochemical replacement scenarios that there will be actual measurable impact. But underneath that is a commercially infeasible space where it's not going to work. And many people have tried already. For several decades, there have been $100 million investments in the US in particular into these kinds of projects. And they failed. Now, there are many reasons why they failed. But in particular, I would say they failed because they went for the most attractive target, which was the fuel. 
if they had instead aimed for a higher value product, they might still be around. And can, that would have given them a lot more experience. And that experience is very important in order to optimize these systems and lower the price, at least to give it a try. So I made some estimations myself. If we were to start a startup, and I'd say within four years, I want to reach break even. So we're profitable. We can run on our own profits, essentially. Uh, it's a bit of a complicated slide, but I have a heterotrophic system on the left. So that's yeast or bacteria or instead the photosynthetic system on the right, which is what you'd have with cyanobacteria or eukaryotic algae. And I've taken the best values of what has been published in the literature. And this is based around productivity, because productivity is one of the key factors in determining whether something's going to be financially sustainable or not. And unfortunately, we reached the conclusion that you probably need to be about still 10 euros or dollars a kilogram to reach that break even with a yeast or bacteria based system, but one magnitude higher with the photosynthetic system. Okay, so that's not great news, but there are opportunities. Well, before we go into the chemical opportunities, I'd like to highlight that colleagues of of mine in, in Germany, Ralf Steuer and their Celdeg startup, have actually been able to achieve several, well, at least one or 20 or 30 fold higher productivities than we otherwise have seen before. And this is actually very exciting. The problem is, apparently, it's not easy to scale, but it illustrates that the issue isn't the biology. <coughs> But the issue is technical, rather. So there needs to be more technical innovation there. Going back to this pathway from before, we have octanol as a diesel replacement, potentially only worth a dollar or two a kilo. So not a great starting point. But if you add another enzyme, you can make octal acetate, which smells of orange or citrus fruit, and it's actually sold for about up to $100 a kilo on the market. Or if you add another enzyme and make a glucoside, all of a sudden you have a bio detergent, which is valued higher than gold. Can you imagine? <laughs> We're making gold in the lab. There is an issue, of course, is that it's not just about price. You also need to have the market demand. And that's what we found out the hard way when we started to interview companies whether they wanted these products or not, they essentially just glanced over it and started asking for other things instead. So you need to find the right starting point. Another aspect which I've been thinking about is the, uh, the full cost model. Because when we go and fill up our car at the petrol station, we pay a certain price. But what we don't pay for is the damage that that causes, which of course you can imagine is difficult to quantify, but people have tried. Uh, you have pollution, accidents, global warming, etc. Who pays for that? Society pays for that. So everyone pays, regardless of whether I drive a car or not. So that's why it's actually a subsidy. The problem is, when I looked at the numbers, that subsidy is only roughly about the same as the trade value. So it's only going to, at the most, double the price of fuel if governments were to implement it. But as you can imagine, it's politically very sensitive as well. Another aspect would be the carbon pricing. About almost two kilograms of carbon dioxide is, is used to produce each kilogram of algae. So that's good. We could get some money for that. There's a, there's a price per carbon. The problem is you also lose greenhouse gases or carbon dioxide as part of the process if we assume that the electricity is not renewable. But the bigger problem actually is probably the, the fact that the price per carbon is very, very low. So it's not really going to be a major revenue stream as such still. 
Okay, so in these last couple of slides, I'd like to tell you some of my experiences with trying to translate some of these things. I'm now in academia, but I'm also very interested in the business side of things. And there's a relationship between academia and business that I sometimes feel has a bit of a void in between them. Are they talking enough with one another? Because we, really we could really benefit from getting the challenges from business and working on them and then being able to easily communicate with them. It could also represent the fact that there's, in my feeling, a lack of funding for that middle bit to translate our findings into business. Traditionally, we would generate scientific publications open for everyone to see. Businesses can then use that knowledge, develop technology, and scale that. And then they generate impacts, more jobs, societal benefits, and revenue. And that impact is something that we are asked now <coughs> to quantify, to essentially argue the case for why we should exist in the first place. We use it in our metrics. Not so easy, actually. Sometimes it's also the protection of intellectual property, which you could license to businesses who still would probably need to do more development and scaling up. And that could generate revenue for the academia. And these are all happening, and it's great. But I'm more excited about this part, where we would develop our own business. And the reason why I find it exciting and so right for people like myself, who claim to be working with applied sciences at least, not necessarily fundamentalist, is I can participate in this process. I have so much to learn from trying to do this, but I also have things to offer, to teach. I can shape the direction and essentially have this feedback loop. And it really opened up my eyes when I got involved with entrepreneurship uh, because it made me feel that, oh, maybe we're not really working in the right direction. This is probably where we should be heading in order to reach the end point which we all want, which is the impact. And we did so. We had some startups. We had Cyclic Bio developing carbon based chemicals. Johnny, who's here today, was pitching in New York in front of lots of investors. We had BioF Solutions with Marine, who's also here today, developing new fertilizer products. But both of these have ended because we didn't have the experience and we didn't start them in the right way. But one shouldn't give up. So with this experience, incredibly invaluable experience and new ideas, we now have Nuriso which is focusing on a different kind of product based on soil as the target. And Marine is the CEO of that, and we have two employees as well, and that's in Harpenden and doing really well. And it's exciting. That is what excites me when I wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. So just to finish up on some lessons and thoughts about this, in the first case on commercialization in general. My feeling is, and it would take me longer to explain all of these things, but there are more ways than one to start. There are more opportunities that we could go for. You can also start without first protecting your IP. You don't have to insist on filing patents and having that as the basis of starting companies. I find it's critical, from my own personal experience, to incorporate the companies well and to spend that money. It costs money, but you need to spend it. And also to put a lot of emphasis on making sure you're surrounded by the right team. And old people like myself have a part to play. And I'm saying that because uh, I've come across a lot of accelerators 
big ones, where they essentially are, their mindset is focused on young people, which is great. Young people are important. They work hard without being paid sometimes. <laughs> uh, but if you got some older, older ones around, why not use them? They have so much experience and they can offer to these early stage startups. I also think there are some opportunities for the UK. Uh, I think there could be more flexible translational funding from the Innovate UK or other sources, where they often demand industrial partners, which can be challenging, and that doesn't quite work for startups. And also, sometimes they don't give you 100%, which is a pain. It's painful. I think there would be some opportunities if they could also consider 100% funding. And then the big question, how will we end fossil fuel subsidies? Even if it doesn't make a big difference, at least it would change the behavior in people if we could make them realize that there's a cost to everything that we do. Finally, just some repetition on the sign and material biotechnology. Once again, we need to start in a profitable manner. We need to aim for being profitable by chasing the higher value product and then subsequently shift to the higher volume product because it isn't until then at that stage that you really have measurable impact. Before that, it's just a business making money for a small amount of people. We're developing a new technology. We need to optimize it, scale it, and we need to have empirical learning Predictions are great, but empirical learning is maybe even better. And then finally, aim for that impact. So with that, I'd like to just uh, do some acknowledgments. There's lots of people that have worked with me throughout the years. They're all listed up there and more. And then for all the sources as well. So, and most importantly of all, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. And it's great that you've been here to listen to what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Nice talk. Um, and now we have some questions from uh, the audience and the questions from the audience online. So we'll start with questions from the audience who are here. If anybody's got a question, yes. Oh, you, sorry, I should have said, don't start speaking until you speak in the microphone. We hope that it's on. Can we hear it? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, just very briefly, could you tell us why the two first startups failed and why the third one is still going strong? That's, uh, it's a bit of a personal and sensitive question, I would say. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you later on. But, um, I mean, there's, there's nothing particular about it, but it's something I, I, I don't really want to talk about in, in public as such. I, I, would, I would say that it's essentially about not having the experience. And I feel that going through that process of starting and failing, starting and failing, has been extremely important for it wasn't the IP. It was... No, no. It, it was basic basic things about how to set up companies and uh, etc. Yes. With the next question? Oh, there's one up there as well. You can have Thanks, very interesting. Um, as I was sort of watching you talk about the, the pilot project and obviously the cost shortfall uh, or, or value shortfall, um, made me think, is, what's the potential for this in well, one very highly regulated industry, which springs to mind, which is aviation, where, you know, the push to e-fuels. I mean, I, I don't know if you've worked on it particularly, but I'm aware that there is soon some work done at Imperial about producing hydrogen from um, biological processes, or whether you can go straight to the, to, to the necessary e-fuels for aviation. But clearly there's the, the, the cost potentially could be offset some other way, um, mm. rather than being, because it's not such a free market, you know, it's not consumers buying the fuel, it's, it's obviously it's a different arrangement. So I'm just curious, really. 
Yeah. And obviously the scale and the drive for innovation you can get from aviation as well is, you know, if it's mandated, is pretty massive. Totally, totally. <clears throat> I, I've actually worked with hydrogen before in Japan. I had uh, a, a group there. Uh, we developed biological systems. But we kind of ended up proving that it's not going to work um, because of the thermodynamic challenges. Um, but we were able to create several synthetic pathways to make hydrogen. Um, but the problem is that you can't extract all of the electrons from, the, from sugar, for example. Uh, we didn't even try photosynthetic routes. Uh, we were just focusing on, on sugar as a substrate. Um, I think it's a challenge, uh, but hydrogen is, is the ultimate fuel, isn't it? Like, it'll be amazing, and we need it, and there will be renewable hydrogen for sure in the future. Now, with the jet fuel, it's interesting that you mentioned that, because uh, after we published the work on propane, uh, Nigel Scruton in Manchester started a startup uh, based on that IP, and it's still going. And I hope I'm not speaking too much in public about these things, but I think they have jet fuels in mind, yes. So that is one of the, um, the targets. It's definitely there. Question. I think there are certain like armies or whatever that are willing to pay a lot more than the usual customer for these. Yeah. Um, the concept of taking both carbon dioxide mm. and nitrogen uh, to the atmosphere where it's available freely is obviously very attractive. But how about the difficulties of genetically engineering these uh, organisms? Yes, uh, really good point that you make. Well, the fact is that they, we don't need to. So that's one answer. On the other hand, if we could, I think there's even more opportunities out there. So those images that I showed you there, it was not with genetically modified species. So they were actually just naturally existing. The challenge is to find the right ones. Uh, but we are now working in the lab to construct uh, essentially new in nature or rare in nature type systems, which indeed would require genetically modified species. Uh, but I know for a fact that there's already um, billion dollar companies in the US who are selling genetically modified species bacteria for farmers. Now then you could start to argue about genetic editing versus genetic modification, etc. I think that's just a, it's just a technicality in my mind, but I know some people are sensitive about it. We had a question from all the way up there that was very early. Hi, um, what do you hope the future of cyanobacteria actually looks like? So, what I believe or what I hope? Um, maybe both. I think I'm more interested in what you would hope out of this yeah. new technology. I think it's, it's a good question. And the fact is that it's, it remains um, something that excites academics. And yet, we don't see so much at least not that has been engineered, that's actually out there. And I think that is a challenge, and will we ever reach that point? I know there's a Dutch company called Photonol, which has been getting lots of money for quite a while. Unfortunately, they did the same, had the same issue. They went for the low-value products in the first place, because it's attractive to investors to hear that you're going to crash the fuel market or whatever. But I'm... Although they are essentially like a competitor to us, I really hope they succeed. We need a big major success that says, yes, we can do this. We can use these kinds of systems. Because that will then mean that we can point to this as an example when we try to pursue different ones. So I hope, I hope this will become reality. Um, and we just need to work on it. A question here. Yeah. Um, what do you do about like the the dead bacteria once they've like died? Because they obviously don't live forever. That's also a really good question because you generate a lot of waste. Exactly. So uh, an obvious thought in mind would be that you use it as a fertilizer. So it's essentially like a yeast extract, which we 
sometimes eat as humans. It's food. So you could reuse it in that manner. Uh, but there are established methods to take care of that kind of waste. Uh, they're not without their challenges. Um, for example, in the wine industry, in McLaren, well, when, when you're right in the middle of vintage, the place stinks because there's so much waste being generated and it's not being taken, out, taken care of properly. Next question here. Yeah. Uh, thank you, yes. Can I just ask you a question about the actual synthesis? Do you get chiral products or do you always go to racemic mixture? The reason I asked the question is, is linking to you talking about going for the high value products and yeah, not yeah, the, yeah. the low ones. That's a really excellent question. Uh, now, I don't define myself as a chemist, so I'm not going to give you a, an excellent answer on that one. But I know that when we talk to customers, that they're they were greatly interested in that. And they were certainly, it would make a big difference to uh, whether they would be interested in the product or not. At this point, we don't even have the analytics to carefully know what we have, unfortunately. And the standards that we buy are often a mixture as well. So we're not there yet, but there is opportunity my understanding, with enzymology uh, to, uh, to control that to some degree. And actually, Johnny has been creating some mutants um, where he looked at uh, different versions, but I don't think we looked at char chirality yet. No, don't, not quite so fine, yes. Thank you. So there's a question over here. Yep. Hi, Dan. Thank you. I have a question, more kind of blue sky thinking type of question. Mm -hmm. We spoke about biofuels and we mainly spoke from energy production perspective. Mm. But what if we think about the energy storage perspectives? Yes, I think, I mean, this is, this is one of the reasons why fuels, liquid fuels are attractive because they're e easier to store than electricity. Uh, but are you thinking more in terms of being able to use renewable electricity, for example, and... The alternative to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Say that again. More like as an alternative to a, uh, like liquid state batteries uh, from density electric uh, elements perspectives. Yeah. Okay. Now, there are incredible experts on this topic working at this university but probably I'm not that one. <laughs> However, I mean, that is one of the features of liquid fuels. And so we've actually worked in a project called E4 Fuel, because E stood for the electron, four for formate, and then fuel. We would go from electricity to formate into fuel. So essentially storage of that electricity, which is difficult to store otherwise as a fuel. So there's, there's great interest in this area. Uh, it's not something that we're actually pursuing, but I think that's definitely, that's definitely going to happen. I'm pretty sure about that, yeah. In, in terms of chemical bonds, the, for the fuels that we have right now, they're, for weight uh, compared to batteries, they're about 50 times better, and when you actually use them, it's about 25 times better. Just one question. Rather than focusing on a fuel or a product chemical end result that you're then selling, could this not be applied simply to carbon capture itself, which mm. has a, an economic value? Companies are prepared to pay large amounts of money to be capturing CO2 that they've produced somewhere else. Um, I don't know what the end product would be that you're then injecting down into the ground or wherever that becomes stored. Yeah. But is, is that something that could be looked at? My understanding is that it is being looked at and it's being considered. There's even startups like Mike's company that are looking into that. I think the problem is, once again, that is the carbon pricing is so incredibly low relative to how much it costs to just grow these things. For example, to grow algae, you have to mix it, and you have to have gas exchange taking place, and that needs energy input. So one of the issues often is that, for example, if you have a fuel product, 
and it has a certain amount of energy, you want to certainly make sure you don't waste more energy than you actually capture in that fuel. Um, but if the carbon pricing could go up, and maybe, like if we're talking about waste streams, for example, I definitely think there are opportunities that need to be explored. And my understanding is that it is being studied, yeah. I'm trying to shut up on this, but uh, <laughs> it gets to the point where I can't. <laughs> so basically, I don't think it's price is the problem. Energy is the problem. You've got to look at the energy balance. And if the energy balance is wrong, you're making a mistake. And when it comes to uh, using carbon capture and storage with biofuels, the energy input is so small on there that the carbon capture and storage is a mistake. We have a huge problem right now in that the COP21 in Paris that we're, that we're planning to keep the, the global warming down to 1.5 degrees, nearly every project that they were planning to do that, that they, in their computers, in the integrated assessment models, did not take energy into account, and they were all planning to do uh, basically what they call BECS, which is bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. Huge mistake. Two sets of major energy mistakes there. Um, it's not going to work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, All right, there you got the answer. Sorry. My question actually follows on to exactly what you were saying. Um, with recent companies like obviously Lanza Tech having huge commercial traction and therefore gaining public traction, there's a big question on although this is a system where we're being environmentally friendly by carbon capturing, ultimately it's going to be an energy question of is our process net overall positively impacting the environment? So I guess my question is, what are the types of solutions we can look into when we are doing fixating of carbon to make sure that that doesn't cause a problem? I think that's an excellent question and super critical. The problem is the, the science about, of all of this, we're talking about going from genetic engineering to life cycle analysis. There's no single one lab that does all of this. So it's the work of consortia, and, and it does happen. For example, the European Commission almost demands that you always have an element of that in, in every project that they, they fund. But um, I think often, like groups like myself, we're so focused, we're so narrow, we don't always think about all these elements. But that's also what's nice about when you start to think about commercialization questions like that come up, and then all of a sudden you realize you have to prepare for it and, and answer it. Um. Another question up here. Yeah. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, progress in impact on climate change of driving down the cost of solar and uh, wind power. And if you look back, a lot of that was seeded with government subsidy grants mm. 10, 15 years prior when it was uneconomic. So there's a history there of showing that subsidies can kickstart to scale. Mm. I'm not quite clear, and, and it's a different technology you're describing here, if government, if you could influence government role policy materially, do you think they should be picking products and saying, okay, here's the thing to make? Or is it just the carbon price? If the carbon price was $100 a tonne, do you think that in itself would just stimulate enough change? Or, or is there some other route? I suppose, what's the, what, what should government be doing to make this scalable and commercially viable? Hmm. Well, there's lots to unpack there. Um, I don't know much about the carbon pricing and how it's decided upon. I think this is very interesting. Then some elements of that might start to become politically sensitive. Um, but um, I think that um, with the... Uh, Sorry, I lost my, my train. There were so many elements there. So yeah, you started with the subsidies. The the price. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, so the one thing that I thought about when you first started talking about that, which if I could say something to government that you, they could do better is invest more in research and translation with greater flexibility. And I think there... Uh, my understanding is the UK is not putting enough of public funds into research compared to many other countries, and I think that is one, one big change that could be made. Yeah. But more flexibility. Don't constrain it so much. Yeah. 
Do we have any more questions? Um, there's one over there. Let's, let's take it. That's fine. I think the, the, the answer to the, to the question you were saying, the, you made yourself as well, it's a big deal, is to try and get governments to stop subsidizing the petrochemical industry. That's a good place to start. And that's Take easy. that money and move it. You got it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for putting up so many slides, which I want to ask questions about. But I was particularly interested in the one of your Italian compatriot who just went out and constructed an example field. And I felt very encouraged by that entrepreneurship, uh, if you like. Let's start proving it. So I guess my question is, is are there, is it just startups and this new model we have of the uh, tick and tick TikTok influencer and, and culture that we live in? Or is there really an opportunity to take hold of that approach in the way your Italian friend has done? Is that, is that a question? Well, actually, I'm not sure if I can answer it fully, but actually, they also have a business on the side. Mm -hmm. So this is almost like an advertisement for them. Um, but uh, I think the, it, it's like with big problems. You can't just pick the one method you think is going to solve everything and pursue that. It needs to, it's like applying for a job. You don't apply for just one job. You, you apply for many jobs. And, a lot of them will fail, but we need to really pursue that. So, yeah. Okay. So, yes, um, I think we can start wrapping up and go yeah. on to Olaf. the next part. Just the last thing I would say. <laughs> so, yeah, if you were talking to governments what to do, you'd say certainly stop subsidizing the petrochemical industry. But at the same time, when you start legislating, you should only legislate when you have the information that's required to do the right thing. Otherwise, there's a high chance you'll do the wrong thing. And right now in this country, and in many countries, we are doing the wrong thing on a global scale, in fact. And one of those wrong things is the palm oil type stuff you're talking about. So we're talking about biofuels. We're talking about um, agriculture in the States using the using agriculture on a massive scale to provide fuels for cars. That's a mistake. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. And the kind of stuff that uh, we're talking about here with biofuels specializing, getting into something which is, well, right now, as you said, the scale for biofuels doesn't work. <coughs> so, and so what will what I do think is a very positive thing, the kind of stuff, we've argued about this, you know, as the line manager, we've talked about this, and I think biofuels is a huge mistake. But it is a mistake now. It could get better. Let's hope so, because it's pretty bad right now. But, but the point is that doing stuff with the technology that Patrick does and producing useful things, useful chemicals, there are chemicals made on big scales that are fancy carbon chemistry we can't really do with chemistry very well. We can do better with biology. So there's a lot of stuff to be done there before we start making low-value stuff and start burning it on the planet, because that doesn't make any sense on it at an energy level, in my opinion. Um, so message to government is don't legislate to do things if you haven't got the information to know that it's right. And I think we'd all agree on that. And, and we do have major problems right now because we've got the wrong laws in place because the information is not getting across. And the information that is getting across is often skewed by self-interest. And so we've got to watch ourselves as scientists in that domain so that we uh, do not make that mistake again. We have the planet to save. Self-interest should come second. Thank Agreed. you. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. So, the, the next pass, the ne so the next part of this, and I was told that we could talk as long as, until the bovine quadrupeds return to the domicile, um, but because somebody's going to tell us when we're going to bring, uh, we're going to bring the next part, the vote of thanks. Yes. Is that happening now? So we can do that. Ah, oh, I have to do something. You have to do right? something clever, you see? You needed prompting there. Thank you. All right, vote of thanks.
Oh, I see myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Good evening. So it's uh, really a pleasure having the opportunity for this vote of thanks, I have to say. And first of all, uh, a warm hello to Bill and to Patrick, first of all. Unfortunately, I don't see the other people in the audience, so there might be somebody else I know, but <laughs> at least I, I can see those two guys. Yeah, that was exciting. It was, an, it was very, very nice talk, I have to say, and uh, it was... Uh, uh, listening to an exciting field of uh, research and development of R&D, which I'm following myself for a couple of years now, is one thing. And that, but summarizing it in such a way, I have to say that was really impressive. I really liked it. I would love to have one of the uh, a few of these slides, Patrick. By the way, um, that is uh, is an emerging field, you no? Know, and uh, the questions. Uh, which I listened to were extremely good. Uh, some of them identified all uh, the bottlenecks. There are a, a number of bottlenecks, obviously. But on the other side, on the other hand, I have to say, uh, when you listen carefully to what Patrick was saying, uh, there is an enormous potential in this uh, research field. And I think um, uh, Bill said it quite right. Uh, that is always a question to find the right ways to not go into the wrong directions. But on the other hand, it's always a, a thing of invention and research and, and development. And in particular at Imperial, you can nicely there combine uh, your fundamental science, your skills, your understanding, the creation blueprint, photosynthesis, and then use this knowledge to design green cell factories as we listen to. And then maybe in the future, we'll have something that can really compete with bacteria and yeast. And that on its own would be a great success. So great field, great hope. And uh, of course, Pat, a few words to you. So we know each other for a couple of years, for many years you now. Uh, I think the, the time when you were still in Finland in Fuku, and it was a great pleasure when I heard was it into to work with that, that look over the period uh, because this is a bit that, like I feel although it's inches ago for me it's a little bit like my second home as I said a couple of years as a postdoc period. So uh, a great place where you are. You well deserved uh, uh, to be a food professor and you are as obviously for some years already. But uh, you you Absolutely deserve that. You make uh, you are doing a great job. Uh, your scientific publications are great, high impact, well accepted, and I had the pleasure to work with several projects. You, Auto Fuel was was something good fuel. Uh, I would love to continue with that. Uh, other. Uh, products as well, high value products, <laughs> something like that. But I think you will make your way, and there's no doubt. And as I said, in this perfect environment, Imperial, that is an excellent, excellent combination. And um, from my side, I can only say good luck, all the best for the future, for the next either 20, 25 years at Imperial College now. Don't move, stay there. And uh, I, would have, I would have loved to be uh, in the lecture hall now inside. Because I'm pretty sure there will be a glass of Australian red wine later on, uh, which I can't drink together with you. But we will do that uh, at a certain occasion during this year, I'm rather sure. So congratulations. All the best to you. And... Um, a final hello uh, into the audience from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so it, uh, it just remains for me to wrap it up. So there's a lot of thank yous again. So I'd like to thank Olaf for his, for his vote of thanks. It's good to see him. It's a pity he's not here because we would certainly enjoy a drink together. 
Thanks very much to Patrick for keeping us interested and entertained with this lovely talk and many congratulations again. Thanks to the audience for being here and for taking part and making this discussion a very active and lively one, which I think was really worthwhile. I managed to shut up most of the time, which is, I think, so I'll thank me for shutting up most of the time. And, uh, and thank and, you, uh, Bill, for being the chair. Yeah. We'll do that, yeah. we'll do that. So thanks again. We're going to have a drink out here, and I hope you will join us for a chat and to give your individual thanks again and ask more questions. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you.